How's it going, everyone? In today's video, we're going to learn about new versus init in Python. So this lesson is going to focus on understanding object construction and when to use each of these Dunder methods. Starting with the basics, object creation happens in two distinct steps. New allocates the instance, which gives us class level control. Init initializes the instance, which provides us with instance level setup. A good analogy might be a house. New builds the empty house. It handles construction, while init decorates the house. It handles furnishing the house. Most of the time, you only override init. New is for advanced scenarios requiring control over instance creation. Now, before we jump into new and init, let's take a look at some typical usage of init in Python. For this example, we're going to have a class called person. Here, the initializer is going to take a name and an age. Then we're going to assign these values to the instance attributes of the class. That means that when we create a new person, each value we pass in will be attached to the instance. So here we're creating a person of type person who's called Bob with the age of 30. Now, when we print that person or the name and age of that person, we're going to get Bob and 30 back because those are the values or the attributes that are attached to this person over here. Note that new is not defined here. Python's default allocator handles it. The default implementation for new simply calls object dunder new and class to create the instance. Moving on, let's look at when new is called versus when the initialize is called. So for this example, we're going to use a class called debug class. And this time we're going to use the new dunder method. What it does here is take args and quags, and then it prints new called with the arguments and keyword arguments. Then we create an instance of the class. We print that we're returning that new instance and we return the instance. Right below that, we have an initializer that takes a value of type any. Here, we print that the initializer was called with this value. We assign that value to this instance attribute, and then we print that the initializer has finished initializing. Now watch what happens when we create an object of type debug class. When we run it, the first thing that gets called is new, and the arguments it takes are the arguments we supplied to the initializer, with the keyword arguments being nothing because we did not supply any keyword arguments. And what it does is return an instance of the class. And this all happened before we called the initializer, because after we call the initializer with a value called test, and then we finish with that value being assigned to self.value. What's important to note here is that new was called before init, and that's always going to be the case. Next, let's look at some common use cases for the new Dunder method. And just as a little disclaimer, in most cases, outside of metaprogramming, using new is rarely required. So the use cases I'm about to show you are very simple use cases, just to give you an idea of where they could be used and how they could be used. The first use case involves the singleton pattern. Note that singletons are generally an anti-pattern and where possible, just use a module instead as they are already singletons. But considering we're already here, we're going to use it to create a singleton. So here we have a class called singleton, which will be of type singleton or none. This is a class attribute and it's important we have it because we need to check it later when we're creating a new instance. Inside the new Dunder method, what we're doing here is checking whether the class instance is none. If it is none, it means that we have not created a single instance of this singleton. So what we're going to do is create a new instance and return that instance. Now, if we already created a singleton, this will not be none, which means we can just return the singleton, which was already created. This ensures that we will only have one instance at a time. Although one thing that's important to note is that the initializer is called every time, even for existing instances. But down below, I created two instances, one called first and one called second. Then I performed an identity comparison to check whether they are the same objects in memory, and I printed the information of those objects, or at least the names of those objects. Now, when we run this, what we're going to notice is that A is B, and that is true because they are both the exact same object. Something else we're going to notice is that they both contain the value of second, and that's because the initializer overwrote 
the initial value which was set to the instance that was first created. So init still runs every single time. So let's take a look at how we can fix that and create a better singleton implementation. So the very first step is to check whether the object has been initialized or whether the class has been initialized. So here we can create another class attribute that keeps track of that. Then inside the initializer, what we're going to do instead is check whether the class has already been initialized. If it hasn't been initialized, we're going to initialize it with the name and we're going to set initialized to true. With this small fix, the singleton is going to work as expected now. No matter what we do, the name is not going to change. It will keep the name of the first instance. So if for whatever reason you're creating a singleton, just be aware that the initializer will be called multiple times. The solution is to use a flag to prevent reinitialization, as shown in this code. Another use case could be when you want to subclass immutable types. This is where the new Dunder method becomes essential because immutable types can't be modified after creation. No initializer block can change them. So for this example, we're going to create a class called positive integer, which inherits from the int type. Now inside the new block, we're going to take a value of type integer and we're going to return an integer. Now you have to be careful with this part and I'll explain why in just a bit. But inside, if the value is less than zero, we're going to raise a value error because that's not a positive number. Any number below zero is a negative number. But if the value is positive, we're just going to call super and new with the value. So it's going to create a new instance of positive integer with the value. And for immutable types, we must use the new Dunder method to create the instance. Right below, we're going to create an instance of this positive number, which will contain the value of 42. Notice how Pyrite is complaining. This is because we specified in new that this would return an integer. Even if it's of type positive int, the code editor or your static type checker won't be happy until you insert integer here. In general, you want to avoid surprising types whenever you can, because this just becomes unmanageable and confusing. For now, it's fine. Let's just print that positive number. And what we should get as an output is 42. If we print the type of the positive number, you're going to notice that it's going to be of type positive integer, which is our custom class. Otherwise, if we try to create a negative number, such as a positive integer with the value of negative five, we're going to encounter a value error, the one we raised here, because it is less than zero. And when we run this, you'll notice that down below, we will get an error that says the value must be positive, or we're not really going to get that error because we are handling it by saying we encountered an error. We can also use new with the factory pattern. And in the previous example, I just showed you that we got a surprising type back. As you can see here, we returned an integer. So the code editor thinks it's an integer but the type thinks it's a positive integer. So this is just confusing. And in general, you should avoid this at all costs because it's confusing. But sometimes breaking the rule of non-surprising types is acceptable, such as in the case of a factory object. In this case, it might be acceptable to return types that vary from the actual type we are instantiating, as long as they encapsulate the idea. For this example, we're going to create a shape that can return either a rectangle or a circle. So here we have the new Dunda method, which takes a shape type. It takes some arguments and some keyword arguments, and it returns to us a union type, which can either be a circle or a rectangle. If the shape type is equal to a circle, we're going to return a circle. L if the shape type is equal to a rectangle, we're going to return a rectangle. And in every other case, we're going to return a value error, or we're going to raise a value error because we have no idea what shape that is or how to instantiate that shape. Then right below, we're going to create those two classes, a class called circle, which takes a radius and a class called rectangle, which takes a width and a height. Now down below, we're going to create two objects, one which is a circle and the other which is a rectangle. Since we specified the shape to be of type circle, or we didn't really specify it to be of type circle, but we inserted circle here, this shape is going to return to us a circle. Down below, we specified this to be a rectangle and we passed in the appropriate arguments for a rectangle, a width and a height. So this is going to return a rectangle. And we can verify that by printing both the circle area and the rectangle area. 
And when we run this, what we should get back is the circle area and the rectangle area. Now, unfortunately, if you were to run MyPy, you would get some errors back because the expression has type shape, but the variable has type circle and rectangle. Even if the union type is correct because the class returns either a circle or rectangle, MyPy is forever going to think that this should be a shape. So that's something that you have to deal with. Now, something you need to be aware of is what happens when you return the wrong type from new. For example, here we have a confusing class, which has the new Dante method and returns a string. And the crazy part here is that this type annotation is correct, but we are returning a string, not an instance of the class. If we create an object from this confusing class, the object is not going to be a confusing class instance. It's going to be a string. Then we're going to print the type of the object and whether that object has the attribute of value. If we run this, what we're going to get as an output is that the type of this object is a string. And this object has no attribute named value. The solution here is to only return instances of the same class or subclasses. So now we have a proper class, which takes a value once again, and this returns a proper class instance. And this just means that this time, when we create the object and we print this object, we're going to get the actual instance back. And this also means that if we were to print the type of the object and were to check whether it has an attribute called value, we would get back the proper class class back and this check would return true because now it does have this attribute, which finally means we can use it. We can refer to object.value and print it. Something else that can go wrong is forgetting to return from new. If new doesn't return anything, or if it returns none, Python can't create the instance and in it will fail with confusing errors. For example, here we have a broken class and inside this broken class, we have a new Dunder method, which returns nothing. It just says that it's creating an instance. Now, if we try to create an object from broken class and we try to access the value that we gave it, what you're going to notice is that we're going to end up with an attribute error. The solution is to always return an instance from new. So this time we're going to create a class called fixed class and it's going to return a fixed class instance. Next, we can instantiate it and grab its value. And this time it's going to work perfectly fine. Next, let's look at a much more practical example. And here we're going to create a custom enum with the new block or with the new Dunder method. And enums are a perfect example of when new is essential. The enum framework needs to control instance creation to ensure each enum value is unique and properly registered. So for this example, we need to import enum from enum. Then we're going to create a class called HTTP status, which inherits from enum. Inside here, we're going to have these three enums. And below that, we're going to use the new Dunder method, which takes a code of type integer, a message of type string, and is success of type Boolean. And all of this returns an HTTP status instance. This will be used to create an enum instance with custom attributes. And this is called for each enum value definition. We must use the new Dunder method because enums are immutable after creation. So here we're going to create an object which is going to call new and pass in the class. Then we're going to set a value for that enum. And this is the value that you're going to get when you access the enum. Then below that, we're going to set our custom attributes. And MyPy and PyWrite are going to complain because it doesn't know that these attributes exist just yet. That's perfectly fine. We're creating them here. And then we're going to return the object. Next, we can use this by referring to the HTTP status and to its attributes. So I'm just going to paste this in. And as you can see, we have HTTP status .ok, which uses .ok. And then we can grab the code, the message, and whether it is a success. Now, when we run this, what we should get as an output is first the enum, then the code, then the message, and whether it was a success or not. We can also access the value. So if we try to get the value back for not found, what we're going to get back as an output is 404. And you can still iterate and compare everything. For example, we can loop through the HTTP status and print the status name, the code, and the message. 
And when we run this, what we're going to get as an output is the name, the code, and the message for each one of them. So this demonstrates why new is essential for enums. It allows us to set both the enums value and our custom attributes. And also the enum framework requires new to control instance creation. We couldn't use init here because enums are designed to be immutable. So when should you use init and when should you use new? Well, you should use init when you are setting up instance attributes, working with mutable types, when you want normal class initialization, and when you want the standard Python object creation flow. Use new when you are subclassing immutable types such as integers, strings, tuples, etc. When you are implementing the singleton pattern, when you are creating factory methods, when you want to control instance creation or caching, when working with meta classes, and when you need to return a different type than the class itself. Now you might be wondering about the performance impact that new has on creating objects. Well, here we're going to create a class that uses an initializer and one that uses new. Then we're going to create a function called time creation, which is going to take a class. And here we specify the iterations to be set to 100,000. So essentially we're going to create each class 100,000 times. Next, we can calculate how long it takes to create a regular class versus how long it takes to create a class that uses new. Then we're going to print the information. So first we're going to look at how long it took with just an init block. And then we're going to look at how long it took with a new block. And to see the difference, we're also going to print how much slower new was than init. And when we run this, what we should notice is that new was much slower. Or much slower, I mean, it was two times slower. Although if we were to put new time in front of regular time, the difference would be less noticeable. And from what I understand, that has to do with warming up the interpreter or something along those lines. So please remember to always perform your own performance tests before using this information. But in general, new is typically going to be slower due to the extra method call overhead. So just to sum this video up, you should use the init dunder method when you are working with normal classes for mutable types to set up attributes and when you want standard object creation. And you should use the new dunder method when you are subclassing immutable types or when you want to control construction, such as when you are working with singletons and factories. You can also use them when you want to return a different type and for advanced metaprogramming scenarios. Remember that new is always called first and init second and that new must return an instance, which is usually of the same class. Init is called on whatever new returns. If new returns none, init won't be called. If new returns a different type, init won't be called on that type. But yeah, that just about covers everything I wanted to talk about in today's video. Do let me know in the comments section down below whether you still have comments, questions, or if you would like to learn more about the new Dunder method. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.